Recording now. Okay. So, here we are. Welcome everybody to our latest uh, Lady Sue Lunch. Um, it's November. It's just about Thanksgiving and I thought what a perfect time um, to talk about harvest and our gratitude for the food that we have. Um, I'm in the process of doing this tablescape for the holiday, so I really like this. I've gotten the spode um, plates with the little foxes because out in our little yard and farmette out here, we've had some, uh, some adorable little foxes uh, for many years, so I really uh, wanted to interpret that into, uh, into the... Satter from Satter Farms. Many of you probably know her and uh, her husband, Eberhard Mueller, who is a very uh, famous chef everywhere from Windows on the World to Blue Tess. And um, that's where th they met. Paulette was, I'll let her tell her whole story, but she was a wine uh, salesman. And um, she and Eberhard fell in love and got married. And Eberhardt was in my first book, The Hamptons and Long Island Home Run Cookbook. And you can see here, I have so many great stories going out until they have a beautiful home out on the North Fork. And just beautiful recipes that he made for the photo shoot. And um, it was really just a lovely day. I was there with Lindsay Morris, a great photographer, and uh, I was so appreciative that they took the time to indulge us with his story. So he had some great ones from the early days of restaurants in New York. But uh, he and Paulette, then they purchased their farm out in um, in Long Island and had been growing fresh vegetables. So I thought, again, going with the harvest theme and the tablescape sort of got hunting and things on it here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm also the author of uh, The Art of the Garnish and a little plug for an upcoming event that I'm gonna be doing, uh, Holiday House. So I'll post some more information about that. But it's at the Elizabeth Taylor collection. I didn't even know that Elizabeth Taylor used to live in Manhattan, but she lived there with Richard Burton for a time. So they're taking that event space and uh, December 8th, 9th, and 10th. So I'll give you some more, like I said, information about that then. And um, I'm going to create a nice signature drink. And I guess you can guess what, what color it might be. Um, violet, because of Elizabeth Taylor's eyes. So I'm going to be creating a drink with that. And I just got a bottle of Wolfer Estates gin to be able to try out. So I'm going to going to be doing that. So I hope all of you have your Thanksgiving plans in place. Um, let's see if I invite Paulette. I mean, she's really doing a wonderful job for us because she's getting ready for Thanksgiving with all of the orders, you know, so um, she's out in the field. She's probably got so many things going on with directing the trucks and getting everybody together. <laughs> oh, boy. I should be on, Leanne. Yes, I see you here now. We'll go over this way. So I can see you. Can you see me? Yes. Yes, so it's great. So welcome. Thank you very much for taking the time. I was just explaining to the viewers that how busy you are with Thanksgiving and getting all of the produce out. And um, I don't know, do you celebrate Thanksgiving after all of the work that goes into oh, it? Well, it's our, certainly our busiest time of the year because it's a holiday that's based around food. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, We've been putting like 16 hour days in and wow. harvesting, processing, production, packing, shipping. So it's been a little crazy, yes. A little but, crazy. But um, thank you for having me. I'm well, excited cute. to be with you. 
Cheers to you. I have uh, the luxury of indulging in some a little bit of champagne while you're still on the clock. And I don't. <laughs> exactly. Getting everything going. So, and my uh, little cheers with the ladies who lunch fork and what better because you're in the North Fork. So why don't you first, we'll set the stage a little bit and then get on to the business of it. But um, tell us how you got started. I mean, you're a woman after my own heart because you're a horticulturist um, and very much concerned about the plants, but where you had met, I just showed the book, the Hamptons and Long Island homegrown cookbook and how we had been at your house that day with the photo shoot and you were so gracious then, but how you two met. And it's just, to me, your whole story of Satter Farms is really very much a love story. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you went from being, you know, in the restaurant business in New York to being in the, the plant and farming business. I mean, they go together. <laughs> sure. sure. Well, uh, 24 years ago, I was in the wine business in New York City, selling premium wines to restaurants. And my husband was the chef at Lutece. Um, he had just taken over Lutece. He had a review in December and had gotten all these stars in the New York Times. And so all of us salespeople wanted to sell him because back then, Restaurants didn't have sommeliers. It was not a given. Mm. It was a long time ago. And so um, whenever somebody new took over a restaurant, we kind of descended on, on them like, you know, a plague. And uh, I couldn't get an appointment with him. So that was very upsetting. But I had uh, my, my girlfriend and I. Uh, always took each other out for her our birthdays and her birthday was in January so I said to her you know I've been trying to get an appointment with the chef at uh, Lutece and to no avail why don't we go there for your your birthday dinner she says wonderful so we went and um, his sommelier apparently went into the kitchen and said to him well um, you know this Martin Scott saleswoman is sitting at table x and um, I think you might want to meet her. And he's like, I'm not going to talk to a salesperson. And he said, no, I think you might want to meet her. And so he came out to our table and he like didn't leave. And I'm like, go cook for me. <laughs> and so um, we had a great dinner and um, he called me the next day. He got my number out of the reservation book. So and I guess it was, was like love at, love at first sight. Well, I was not too keen to date a chef because I'm a morning day person. I'm not a night person and mm. I don't want to be, you know, sitting at a bar waiting for my, you know, a boyfriend to get off work. It's not my idea of, mm. of a way to spend my time. But uh, we, we cautiously um, danced around each other a little and uh, ended up, we met married and bought our farm all within one year met in january wow. bought our farm and married we got married on christmas day chefs it was chef's day off oh so. that's sweet oh that's very sweet mm -hmm. so happy anniversary coming up so then what made you decide to move to the north fork like it wasn't too long after what 97 you moved to long island sure one of the first things we discussed that summer was well what do you want out of life? And I told him, I'd like to own some property, you know, a farm. And he's like, oh, that's great. I, I could use vegetables in the yeah. restaurant. He's very and practical. So, yeah. Yes. And um, so the first time he went out with me was when we saw the farm that we bought. And it did not have a house because they had spun the old farmhouse off so that the the widow who was still a living could stay in her house uh so we bought a barn and a cottage and land and built a house proceeded to build a house it's and beautiful that was, that was a lot of fun together yeah and how, so, how yes, many years it started did in it, how many years did it take to build oh well, one year oh, okay. um in the meantime when we were building we would leave the dinner service at Lutece at like midnight on Saturday night and drive out mm. to the, the, the North Fork. And we had um, uh, started making plans to have dinner with the Hargraves at uh, their vineyard. And so we would cook on Sunday nights together 
and uh, we had the best time with uh, Louisa, Alex, and their two kids. Um, just a lot of fun, tasting through wines, doing different parlor games. We just had the best time. And um, I remember Alex said he gained 14 pounds with. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine uh, all that uh, good food uh, and every wine. Sunday night. Oh, that was great. So yeah. then uh, my understanding, both from interviewing Eberhardt and uh, chatting, is that uh, it was some time then you decided that he's not going to be a chef in the restaurant anymore and you went into the farming full time. But how did that come about? How did that decision? I left my job first in, um, in 2000. And um, uh, I mean, prior to that, I was in taxi cabs with my wine samples, making one call to sell vegetables, another call, call to sell wines. And uh, we were just sort of, how could I put this, dumping money on the farm. And, and I said to him, you know, one of us has to be out there and control what's going on. And I guess right. that's me. So I did. I kind of moved out there. Well, you know, he would try to drive home at night. He'd be stopped for swerving on the road. He wasn't, it wasn't because he was drinking, he was exhausted. Yeah. And after 9-11, it just became clear to us mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it was, it was just time to make a change. Yeah. The yeah. city was a little sad back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the transition was not that difficult for us. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes circumstances help accelerate our decisions. You know, recently with the pandemic, a lot mm. of people have, you know, made different transitions. I was saying to you when we were talking about this, a lot of the ladies who lunch, you know, the viewers will say, well, you know, their job changed or their life changed with this, these uh, milestone mm. events. So they take up either a, a new career or something that had been a passion of theirs. And I know because I'm also a garden designer besides being an author and that so many of the people that had either moved out of the city or came to their country homes for more of a, you know, they had to work remotely and they wanted their yards to be more or their places to be more of a resort or, you know, they wanted to grow their own foods. And, you know, I think there had been a burgeoning um, interest in, you know, fresh vegetables and fruits and local foods. I mean, this is what I heard from a number of the chefs that I interviewed for the homegrown uh, cookbook. You know, it wasn't enough to have exotic foods from foreign lands, let's say, but now people wanted, and the chefs started this obviously, but then people wanted to have the local the local food. So, um, you know, if people are interested in starting a farm, certainly not on your scale, but maybe you can give us an idea of how it went from your weekend farming for, you know, food for the, for Eberhardt's restaurant to other chefs to now your, uh, I would say, are you a global brand or you're certainly a national brand? You're featured in Whole Foods and, you know, supermarkets. And oh, so no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can give us an idea of how yeah. you... Well, the... yeah, when we first started, we just had a little garden. And then what was the decision? When to say... we started, we just yeah. had a little garden. It was literally like... Mm. Yeah. And, and then it starts to become a little bit bigger, maybe, than you're saying when he brings it into the other chefs and they want more. So then did you start to buy more land? Um, well, yeah, it grew slowly over the years. We first started with a garden that was about, oh, I don't know, 50 by 100 feet. And it was very small. Um, then we added um, hmm, 12 acres, then an additional 35 acres. And then one year we took a big plunge and took on uh, 140 acres. Wow. So this past year we were farming approximately 240 acres of, wow. of uh, our vegetables, especially vegetables and greens. And years ago we decided to focus on the baby leaf salads because we kind of figured, well, if there's a hurricane or terrible weather, and we've got baby leaf 
seating rotations, if we lose one or two seating rotations, it's not the end of the world. Mm. So for example, we see baby spinach every three days in the growing season in order to have baby leaves of spinach. Mm. So if we lose one, two rotations, there's one right behind it. Whereas if you're growing well, for example, grapes on the vine, if they get ruined in a hailstorm, you lost your whole season. And we didn't want to, we wanted to have the consistency of, of having the produce. I see. That's very smart. Now, do you, do you continually learn? I mean, I love, I belong to a number of horticultural associations and I'm always doing webinars and learning, but I imagine the farm keeps you pretty well occupied. So how do you keep current with what's happening or come up with, you know, the strategy that oh. you have in Oh, it's a constant learning. Um, I mean, it probably took us, I want to guess, like five years to perfect every crop that we grow to the point where we were really happy with it. Um, and it involves everything from seed selection through, you wouldn't believe all the little things that matter as, as you're farming, such as, uh, um, well, the seed quality, um, the seeding mm -hmm. density, the depth, when you water it, spacing, uh, um, so on and so forth. And so every little thing matters. It's like when a chef cooks, I could take a recipe from Eberhard's and, and follow it and cook, but it doesn't taste the same because all these little things change it drastically. Yeah. But we, we're constantly, um, well, pre-COVID, um, visiting farms. That's what we do if we ever take time off. Um, right before COVID hit in February of 2020, we mm -hmm. went to a spinach seed trial in Texas. And that's where um, growers will get together in the region and they'll plant many different varieties of the spinach. And the seed um, houses will be there talking about their different varieties and you can compare. You know, we live in a, in a humid, rainy climate quite frankly, in, in the summer on Long Island. And so we want a spinach that um, has a, a sort of a thicker leaf and, and can take the heat and humidity rather than a thinner leaf. So mm -hmm. we're constantly looking at varieties. Do you hybridize your own or do you ever come up with a Satter Farms seed or have you ever thought about marketing that? Oh, no, that's, that's the whole thing realm of study in and of its own so no we we, we don't get involved in that we do yeah. use varieties that we that are that are researched and developed you know with with seed companies and that's their job yeah try, tried and true have, what changes have you seen over the time you've been doing commercial farming like you have with climate chaos or climate change have you you know been able to distinguish you know discernible changes, I should ask. There is a noticeable and huge difference. Uh, springs have started a little later, falls last longer, but the summers, there are crops we just can't grow in the summertime in Long Island anymore. We used to grow frisee all summer, and <gasps> now we have to stop in July, around July 20th through about the second week in September. It's just too hot for it anymore, hot and humid. I have to say that's one of my fondest memories. I was with Eberhard. He took me out in the truck, and then I was watching how they put the little caps, you know, to make the white frise, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Was, that we, we, we make those caps. Well, we have a, a company that makes them for us in Florida, and so we do sell them um, either on our website or through Johnny Seed Company in Maine. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I mean, that was fascinating to me to see how that production was done. And uh, so many people didn't know about, you know, how that how that happens. I mean, I, there is a magic that goes along with, you know, plants and gardening and growing. And um, mm -hmm. I think it's endless. You know, people are just, you know, fascinated to, to learn how these things come about. I mean, we did the children's gardening program at BBG and you know, we know that when children start to grow things, they'll eat those vegetables. They'll they'll want th that food even more. But there's that miracle that goes on. And, and I dare say, I think even for adults now, when they start to learn more about it in this, you know, I would say, I hope it's more than a trend, 
but you know people who are growing their own vegetables or have an awareness to purchase you know good fresh food um, or have a vegetable centric diet you know this was mm -hmm. you know I was reading about uh, Frances Frappe, her book you know the diet was just out of this an article in the Times but when she first started you know she was considered kind of kooky you know, back in 1977 for this. But what kind of changes have you seen in the market over time? Like, how did you get it into the grocery stores? That takes a lot of effort. <laughs> I, I can spend years soliciting, you know, a, a store group, um, even Whole Foods. I, I, it took me a couple of years to really get uh, our products on the shelf. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's one of the more difficult aspects, quite frankly, uh, that we have. Um, and, you know, as, as the chains start, you know, buying each other and, and yeah. getting larger, it just becomes more and more difficult um, to get the distribution that you'd like. Fortunately, there are, a, there's a strong following for locally grown food and from Day one, that's what we were about. When we started 24 years ago, there was no locally grown food mm -hmm. movement. And when I solicited a store group, uh, they'd say, well, we, we, you know, we load that in California or we get it in the Bronx market, you know. Right, right. I'm like, no, no, this is different. <laughs> and, it and it tastes so good. It <laughs> that's the difference. It tastes good. Exactly. Uh, but I know shelf space yeah. is just, uh, it's like a war for that shelf space thing. So maybe all that wine selling helped you in the farming business also. <laughs> you know, yes, yes. The sales. You know, so, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you know, we, we tried to become a little bit innovative um, years ago at the very start. I used to stand at our kitchen table in our farmhouse and squeeze organic lemons and and make dressings that we put into these little cups into our salads. And we had to stop once we got a little bigger because, you know, me at my kitchen table with a, I didn't even have an automatic juicer. <laughs> so uh, we stopped. But for years, I wanted Eberhard to, to make his dressings. He makes amazing dressings. I don't know what it is. They are just the best. And I said to him, you know, I sit in a warehouse with tens of thousands of pounds of greens and I'll, and I was going out to like Panera for lunch because, you know, I didn't have the dressings. Oh. And so finally I convinced him to start them. And so we did, we packaged the dressings, okay. but for the longest time he was fighting me because he said, I'm not going to do it. He says, what am I going to do? Bottle dressings. People opened it, use it once, put it back in the fridge. They might not get back to it again for a week, weeks. Mm -hmm a month <laughs> it's sitting there getting all sticky and oxidized and rancid with the oils and he said i'm just not going to do it because no. he didn't want to use preservatives i understand yeah. i mean his food obviously yeah. with great chef but the best ingredient they use is love so i see like he has a great dedication and love you know in, yeah. when he makes makes so it. what we did was we did put them into single serve packets Oh. So, uh, yeah, so every time you want a dressing, you open a single serve packet so that it's fresh. So no preservatives, oh. fresh dressings. Yeah, it's great. Oh, that's brilliant. Is that available now? Uh, yeah, but it's not widely distributed because I came out with them right about when COVID hit, well, mm. the summer before. But, um, uh, you know, so we have limited distribution of them. But Fresh Direct, for example, carries them. Oh, good. Okay, so we can get that there. We'll put. I'll put that link in the blog. I'll do, you know, a post show event, and I can put that in there with the link, which is very good. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk these days, especially with the pandemic, and you know that how that sort of navigates through our worlds. But uh, the supply chain, and so uh, you, I guess, in effect, I don't know, but maybe you have your own supply chain or do you have issues or how is that working out? We do make our own deliveries. So we'll deliver like to Whole Foods Warehouse up in Connecticut or, or wherever. So um, we do handle that, but the incoming materials are hard to get, just, you know, boxes. 
and, and bags. Wow. I've been trying to get, you know, some bags here for a couple of weeks. We've run out, we, you know, and so just general supplies. I mean, there was a time I couldn't get, uh, you know, just the gloves that we use, you know, mm. to handle the pro mm. produce. Well, have you seen trends in the, you know, in the vegetables and things that you grow, like, or do you stay consistent over the years or do you change that up? Well, we do see certain trends. I can remember years ago that uh, David Pasternak at ESCA asked if we would grow uh, Tuscan kale for him. And quite frankly, we didn't know it. And so we trialed it and we thought, yep, we can do this. This fits in our program. And so we started growing it and we still are to this day. I mean, it's probably been, I don't know, 18, 20 years now we've been growing it and it's become a, an important item for us. Mm -hmm. uh, Kale certainly had a, a huge <laughs> following for a couple of years here. And um, I think it's tapered off slightly. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what's starting to take its place. I'm, we're into celery a lot, um, but uh, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, well, you know, it's fall. And so yeah. I, I, we tend to just, you know, focus on what's, what's of the moment. And so certainly it's the brassicas. And uh, we do grow cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. Cauliflower is a, a, an heritage crop here in Long Island. Even the, the farmers cooperative out here that um, where we get our seed and fertilize, where we get our fertilizer from is called Long Island Cauliflower Association. Oh. It used to be an important crop out here. Well, not so much anymore, I guess, the way you're saying that. But I adore cauliflower and the Brussels sprouts. We tried to grow the Brussels sprouts in our little farmette here. But what did we get? We got those beetles that were on it, Bill. Mm. Yeah, they got, and, it, and it takes a long time for them to grow. It, yeah, and it takes a long time. So with the limited growing time, we were kind of uh, humbled, I'll say, by it. You know, so sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I I get that. Wait, I have I have a Brussels sprout stalk here. Oh, let's see. I think they're so beautiful. I see them at the. Oh, I, look I at that! They're great. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh my God. Yeah. And so. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually my neighbors. He harvests them, uh, the whole stock, because he has a farm stand. And so it's logical for him to market them as such. Not so much for me, but I do have some uh, retail stores who like them on the stock. So for the yeah. holiday, I brought them in. But yeah. we, har we harvest the individual sprouts ourselves. Yeah. But it's kind of cool. It, it's, you have to grow them differently if you're going to harvest them on the stock um oh about a good oh, six weeks before harvest you have to top them at the top so that you break the apical dominance so that the sprouts will mature all at the same time us for our crop we don't do that so ours uh, mat starts maturing with the bigger sprouts at the bottom so we'll go through and harvest the bigger sprouts at the bottom and then we'll pass through the field again and harvest the ones in the middle of the um, stalk and go by again up further on the stalk. And we can still be harvesting these in, um, one year we hit March, but that's unusual, more like end of January into February. So oh, well, it makes for cropping them like this makes for um, continual supply. Oh, that's fantastic. That, see, I'm learning so much. You have to speak to our Metro Hort group. You would be perfect for that. I have to talk to Charles about doing that. We would learn a lot from you. About that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask a question. I don't know, like, are there a lot of women that do what you do? Or are you kind of like the only one that you would meet that, you know, in a world of men? Or was it, you know, kind of almost common? Well, when we started, it used to be that Eberhard and I would divide duties because if I were to make a call, look for a part, do certain things, I would almost be ignored. <laughs> and so there were certain uh, companies or certain situations where Eberhard would make the call because he had, he was more effective in getting a response. Um, 
there are many more women now in agriculture mm -hmm. and that makes it quite a lot of fun. Um, uh, Pre-COVID, there was a women's group of, of uh, women in agriculture out here as well. Um, but um, yeah, uh, pretty much across the board, whether it's with poultry, um, mm -hmm, eggs, yes, uh-huh. Um, I mean, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of couples too, like Eberhard and I were when we started out. Um, so it's, it's, it's very challenging, but I have to say, I, I still love it after 24 years. You know, once I was filling out an application for something and they asked for um, my job um, description, so, you know, agriculture. And then later on in the form, it asked for a hobby. And I said, gardening. <laughs> and it's true. Even though we're in agriculture, what I, I still love to be out in my garden. There's, there's nothing I love more. And so since COVID hit in, in one of our greenhouses, we used to have lemon verbena growing in the ground in, in the tunnel because it's, it's frost um, tender. So, you know, we had to protect it all, all winter long. So when the restaurants closed, I pulled it all out and I planted a garden. So right now you can walk into my greenhouse and you'll see tomatoes and peppers and green beans and zucchini and cucumbers. And so it's, to me, I just love being in that house. And I so I might spend a, a couple hours on a Saturday in there. I'm so jealous. I'm, I'm entertaining the thought and I really want to get a small little greenhouse for here, but my husband is reticent to do that. But say a prayer for me that I can, <laughs> because we start our own seeds, we do all that. So it would just be lovely, especially in the winter to do, as you say, to have a winter garden where you can go in there and get that kind of fantastic it's, food. It's really a pleasure. Oh, and I've got citrus trees. I've got Meyer lemons and oranges and, and, and key lime. And so it's a lot of fun, you know, up oh, cooking, is. need a lemon, run out to the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. I know we have small little trees inside in the house, but it's, it's just not enough, especially when I'm making so many cocktails or cooking or something, you know, you want to have that fresh citrus to go along with it. Sure. But, you know, with so many people like couples and people, I mean, I like to see young people saying they're getting back into land. I mean, farming is hard, hard work, really hard. It's hard to keep even second, third generations on a farm, but I have been encouraged that it seems like a lot of younger people and people of color that they are going into farming uh, now and with eyes wide open. They know a lot of the challenges that go along with it, but any pearls of wisdom as far as not only the work, but I mean, you have to work with banks and partners and, you know, business associates. So anything that you can offer as far as some life tips yeah, running a business like this encompasses the whole realm. <laughs> you are absolutely correct. I remember when we started and my mom came out to the farm. I grew up in a dairy farm in central Pennsylvania. Okay. And she came out to look at the farm we bought. And she just looked at me and she said, Paulette, what are you doing? You grew up in a farm. You should know better. <laughs> she wanted <laughs> but, you to you know, know. Once, once it's in you, it just is. It's just a, a, I I get such joy out of out of gardening. Let's yeah. just we can say gardening because yeah. even when we first started, I I would go out in the afternoon and weed for a, an hour or so with the crew. I just I just love being out there. I find it very satisfying. Yeah, I think there's nothing like it. I mean, my husband would say we were on a radio. With Sorry, that it's like being closer to God, you know, starting, just being that much closer to God. And I think there's some spiritualness that goes along with growing things. So uh, we all very, I mean, the time is, you know, for the interview is, what? It's creation. Oh, Bill saying it's creation, like you're creating things. So that's why he says, I think it's being a little bit closer to God. So I really, really appreciate you taking the time, especially at this crazy time of year. But like I said before you came on, is that I wanted you because to showcase for the viewers because it's a harvest time. And uh, who better to talk about harvesting than you? So we thank you for your great produce and vegetables and, you know, the food that you give us. So continue. Enjoy you.
and happy Thanksgiving to all. Thank you. Cheers to you and to Everhart. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye-bye.